Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my sunny sunroom. My name is Jen Smith. I am the fiber artist behind Jen and Handmade. This is my very uh, needy little puppy disco right now. We just moved from Los Angeles up to Monterey, California yesterday. So uh, she's having a little bit of trouble adjusting. So you might hear a little bit of barking during this. But um, anyway, I'm going to put her down. So like I said, my name is Jen Smith. I um, am a fiber artist. So I recently did a class with Domestica, like basically a lot of colorful kind of in this style um, embroidery. So be sure to check out my class on Domestica if you're interested in color. I personally love color. Today, I'm going to be showing you some of the fun little things I like to stitch around the holiday times. I love working with series of things essentially like I like making not just one or something but maybe five that are slightly different so one thing I love to do is like little Christmas trees so today I'm going to take you through stitching um, some of these little Christmas trees and see this one is like similar but a lot of sunlight in here today anyway <laughs> I can already hear my dog starting to make a lot of noises so first of all, when I get started, and if you have any questions throughout, obviously just, just shoot out your questions. When I get started, I have lots of different ways that I like to transfer designs, but on something that's fairly simple like this, you could start by just putting the fabric in and freehanding it, which is a perfectly fine way to do things. With this one, I actually put the fabric in, laid it over, traced it using my iPad, and then I flipped it again. And because these lines are such straight lines, I also sometimes use a ruler to kind of fix them once I've transferred them back to the right side of the hoop. I just oftentimes use just regular quilting cotton. So this is probably a Kona cotton. I have a huge selection of colorful um, fabrics that I, I keep on hand. So this one is just, like I said, a regular quilting cotton that you can get at any craft or fabric store. I typically use DMC embroidery floss in all of my projects, so six strand embroidery floss. I like to use a number five embroidery needle for embroideries like this. I typically trace my designs with a Pilot friction pen because it's a heat erasable pen. So if there's any little bits at the end, I can just take um, an iron or a hair dryer and just run it over it real quick and then the lines disappear. And then Obviously some embroidery scissors is a pretty simple, simple amount of materials that you need. So what I like to do for this one, it's gonna be this little checkerboard tree. So I just start up at the top with the orange floss on this one. Pull, I, everyone has their own philosophies. I, I guess I like to not make it too long. It's less opportunity for tangles. And when I separate my threads, I usually use three strands and then I double them and knot them at the end. I find it's easiest if you just go into the middle and pull slowly. And that's another reason why having a, le a shorter length of floss is helpful in this situation. And then just thread that through the needle, which is always the hardest part when you're on camera. <laughs> oh, so go. And go ahead and bring the ends together just like that and tie a little knot and some people don't use knots I like I, I oftentimes use knots and then I also before I pull it through I just trim it just to keep it a little bit cleaner on the back so then I'm just going to start from the top go in at the line and just make a satin stitch. This, this entire tree is stitched using satin stitch. And it's, it's obviously up to your discretion if you wanna use fewer uh, threads or more threads. One second here. For this pr particular project, I typically use straight regular standard quilting cotton so just a, a basic cotton fabric and I just go back and forth 
sometimes you'll get your um, your tail will come through and I just, you know, just pull it back out and just continue to go back and forth. I also, even though it does use a bit more thread, I typically go back to the same side and start every section on the same side and go down on the other one. And you just get kind of into a rhythm here. Stitching back and forth, just checking for questions. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. I'm, I'm here to answer all of your questions. If you can see there, I don't know if it's showing up well in the camera, but there was one little section where I didn't get it perfectly covered. So you can easily just go back over that and cover it there. And so I'll just continue back and forth. It's also up to your discretion at the end if you want to do an outline. So if you're if you feel like your edges aren't exactly um, perfect, you can fix that at the end. So don't worry about that. The pen that I use is uh, the Pilot uh, heat erasable pen. So it's a it's a friction pen. It's spelled F R I X I O N, um, and it just I think it actually even comes in multiple colors, but I typically just use black. And like I said, if there's any little bits at the end, it'll come. They'll they'll go away with um, a hair dryer or an iron over it really lightly. They they erase right up. Every once in a while, if you're working on like a really with a really dark, if you make a really dark line, there'll be kind of a ghost, almost a slight a slight hazy whiteness. So you do want to. I mean, you want to be mindful of that and not um and try to be as close to the covering it up as you possibly can be i buy embroidery hoops um someone just asked where i buy embroidery hoops i buy them all over the place honestly um i get a lot of them at like michael's and joann's they all have embroidery hoops um there are also some really nice ones that i wish i had my list right now of um these are just really basic ones, like these little three inch hoops. These, I just think I got a package of them off of Amazon, but I'm trying to think of some, if I, if I can remember, there are some places that have just really beautiful, nice hoops. Uh, so, okay, so I'm done with this first section. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and I tie knots on the back as well. And I just go through it once, catch it and secure it back in the back and then trim it off with my scissors and then I'm going to switch colors and a lot of this stuff is just personal preference if you wanted to do all the orange first and not you, you know you can keep going with all the orange you could go you know across the whole way you can go down the whole way whatever is your preference go for it that's one of the fun things about embroidery is you can really make it your own and do there aren't really any rules whatever feels best to you, whatever you're most comfortable with. So we just, um, I just had the question, what needle should I use for hand embroidery? Some of it depends just on how fine your, your stitching is and, and how tiny the detail is on your piece. For most things like this, I just use the DMC number five needle. It's a really great basic needle. For my first couple of years doing embroidery, it's the only one I used for everything that I did. So I feel like it's a really good um, catch-all needle for almost everything that you use. And if you're doing a really fine, you know, maybe a single thread, I use um, some of the tulip needles that have a really tiny little gold head. And it's basically the maybe the most number of threads you could get through it or two. I mean, it's a very, very tiny, fine little head, but then it leaves much smaller holes. So you can do a little bit finer work with that. So now we're just gonna thread this needle again and get the lavender ready to go. Try to get those ends close to even. And then I just do one single knot. Find my scissors. I'm already making a mess, see? And then just trim it up a little bit. 
and then we'll just go in and start. Now at this point, you can experiment with going different directions. So this, these I've been doing like a horizontal satin stitches. If you wanted to have a little bit more differentiation, you could do all the oranges horizontal and all the lavenders vertical, or you can do each row differently, what have you. I did all of these horizontal. So there's just a, a lot of different ways that you can get like slightly different results. You know, it's not gonna be an incredibly huge noticeable difference, but it, it, there are so many fun ways to make just little tiny differences. Hopefully you can see that. And I do know that I will say if the slower you pull your thread through, the less chance it's gonna knot up for you on the top. How do I learn to start embroidering? Someone just asked. Well, one of the great things about Domestica, first of all, is there are tons of great embroidery courses on Domestica. So you could sign up there and take a lot of classes. Just search for embroidery when you're uh, when you're looking. I would say that my course where I teach the style that is in this patch on this um, particular little catch-all that I use to hold my materials is a really good beginner's class. It's mostly satin stitch. You'd also learn French knots, but it takes you through stitch by stitch learning all of that. You can also find on Etsy or anywhere you could find a lot of like digital PDF patterns that would teach you. Obviously YouTube, things like that. There's even these days like really great tutorials on Instagram. So whatever is the best way that you find to learn these things um, is a, a great opportunity. But I really do feel like a lot of great embroidery artists have classes on Domestica at this point, And it's a really great resource to find, you know, a style that you really like and learn all the different stitches um, to get going, get started. And once you learn the basics, it's pretty easy to explore experiment find different things like for example on this particular one this stitch is really in some ways it's what you would call a seed stitch which is just a bunch of little kind of scattered stitches but one of the things that i experimented with and started doing a lot of is getting a little bit crazy with it so i used two different colors here and just kind of filled it with these kind of frantic stitches that that are sort of some I call it a modified satin stitch at this point so it's a little bit of a different stitch but it gives a really fun texture and once you just have the basics of you have your supplies you have the basic stitches the, the world is really your oyster you can really experiment and try to you know find your own way of doing things it's it's a really 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 fun I am a little biased but it's a really really fun thing I, I love embroidering obviously and um yeah, if you have any other questions, certainly just reach out. Yeah, okay, keep going here. So I'm just gonna finish up this square. And once you get in a flow with this, it really does go pretty quickly. This is a, a small project. I'm not sure if I just sat here from start to finish, trying to think how long I expect it would take me, it would probably maybe take me an hour or two. One of, like I mentioned, you can, uh, outline it at the end. So if you, if you put an outline al along the edges of this, that will clear up any imperfections of that. But this also is one of the nifty things about this technique that I do at the end where I just, I run a piece of embroidery floss from top to bottom to make the grid and then tack it with just these little crosshatch stitches so that it also covers up any imperfections. It makes the, the checkerboard look perfect. It's a little trick. And now, like I mentioned before, you can just kind of feel it as you go, but I, I do have this much left, so I don't really want to waste any of my floss. Um, so then we can just go to the next, pop over here and go to the next um, lilac checkerboard. I just had a question. When I stitch, my fabric is puckering. What should I do? So this is a great question. And it is one of those things that um, I think happens a lot early on. There are lots of different things I would say about this. First of all, the higher quality your hoop, the less chance you're going to have of this happening. These little, these little buddies, um, I also think the smaller your hoop probably helps too. So these little three inch hoops 
would be a little bit easier to get tight than a really big, you know, like a seven, eight, 10 inch hoop. It gets like such a huge surface area. It gets a little bit harder to get it tight. But one of the things obviously is you put it in, you put the fabric in there and you tighten it, pull it as taut as you can around the edges. And then I take these with me everywhere I go. I mean, when I travel, I even take just these pliers with me and I use them to tighten more. You know, you, you can get it tighter with the pliers than you ever could with your hands. So I would just do like a couple more and then tighten it some more, the fabric some more, and just kind of continue to work that and go around the edges. And that should hopefully take care of it. I know that some people like to do, use double layers of their fabric, which that makes it a little bit thicker. So it will get in there a little bit tighter. Um, some people also take fabric and wrap this inner hoop as they're, as they're preparing it, they wrap the inside of that hoop in fabric, which gives it more um, thickness and a little bit more grip so that you can get the fabric really tight. It just, you know, and I also actually, I don't think I have any in here, but I've also sometimes taken a hack of using, you pull that fabric as tight as you can. If you have an area that's really, really loose, I pull it tight and I take a little binder clip like you would use in office supplies. And I clip that in there it would be easy on something like this because you're not stitching all the way to the edge. So it doesn't interfere with anything. And then that binder clip will just hold it in there. And then at the end, when you're done, I typically glue the back of mine. So I would take where that binder clip was, I'd glue and I'd hold it and let it dry a little bit to help make sure that there was no puckering. So there's actually quite a few different things that you can do, but I just, I do think the more you do it, the better you get at it. And um, the higher quality hoop, higher quality fabric and my favorite weird embroidery tool is just these like sturdy needle nose pliers <laughs> that really get these a lot tighter than I feel like my fingers ever could do on their own. Okay. And I love a checkerboard. I, I incorporate lots of checkerboards. I know they're really popular right now and I just love experimenting with different color combos. Uh, obviously this is a little bit of a non-traditional Christmas tree here, but I think it's pretty fun. You can absolutely, someone just asked, could you turn this piece into a patch? I did a little um, free tutorial on Domestica showing how I do these patches. And there are many ways to, to do patches, but I, um, use that heat and bond on the back and there's a, a sticky kind that so I would basically do this and if you wanted it to be round once you're done you just take it out cut the roundness that you want affix that heat and bond to the back as you can see here I stitched around the edges and then just um, secure it onto whatever you want and then I would re I know that supposedly that the, the stickiness should be strong enough but just for the way life can be I also then add more tacking stitches around the edge. So this is never coming off. There's no way that this is ever going to come off. But yeah, I think these would be really cute as a patch. You can, I've done patches on hats, obviously patches on little totes, patches on clothing. Patches are fun. For pieces displayed in the hoop, how do you do anything to prevent dust getting on it? Or once dust gets on it, how do you clean it? Good question. I, I'm surprised to say that I don't really, have, I guess I've just been lucky to live in places that aren't super dusty. I don't have a lot of trouble with that, but I would say, I think you could just, you know, just dust them, dust the edges pretty regularly. And even just tapping like that, if you feel like there is dust, it, it, it doesn't harm the piece at all. And it, if it's tight too, it should bounce right back off. I think you could probably also even just use, you know, like a hairdryer or anything that would kind of just disperse some of the dust. Um, and I know some people are starting to actually even put these into like glass shadow boxes. So that would keep it protected if you have fixed this on the inside of a glass shadow box so that it actually, the embroidery wasn't exposed to the elements at all. So I just tied a knot on the back of this, this lavender, lavender lilac, I don't know, <laughs> go back and forth. And so since I started that, I guess I'll just go back to this piece. I keep working. So I just pull the ends as close together as can. 
and then just tie a quick knot and trim it pretty close to the knot itself. I just think that keeps it tidier on the back. So someone just asked, can I wash my embroidery work? My answer on that would be, it depends. So the, the longer your stitches, the less comfortable I would probably be washing it. But these, like on this particular piece, you can see that the stitching is pretty, these are pretty short, like they're not really long stitches, they're pretty short stitches and it's backed. So I feel like it, it has a backing that I would wash this obviously on gentle or delicate, but I do feel like something that is a shorter satin stitch is, fine to wash. I do sometimes from time to time hear that people have issues with some really vibrant colors, like maybe a red might bleed. So you might want to be a little bit careful if you're using a really vibrant color in your stitching. You maybe would want to like test it on something, maybe do a couple stitches on something that you don't worry about and, and try that first. But in general, I think if the, if the stitches are shorter, yeah, it's fine to wash it. Lots of people put, you know, like people would put something, you know, do something on a pocket like this and it's absolutely fine as long as it's not a really long stitch because then it'll warp when it gets wet. So I'm just gonna continue on here. Which this does bring me to another point of like a personal preference sort of thing. I like with my embroidery, I, I like to always be coming up from an edge that if it's possible, which sometimes it's just not possible coming up from an edge that doesn't already have embroidery on it. So for this, as you can see, I'm starting here on this empty edge. Now I could skip over and fill in this side with the lilac, but I would like to do orange here so that I'm starting with something that doesn't have any embroidery going into embroidery. And the same here, then I could do the lilac into the orange. So I'm going to actually skip down to this box so that I can continue to give myself one edge that doesn't have embroidery to work from. What fabrics are the best to embroider on? A lot of it I find is personal preference. I really do most of my embroidery on cotton. Just your basic everyday quilting cotton is what I do most of mine on. But I've also used linen and linen is great. I think especially once you have a little bit more experience because it's a little bit of a looser weave. So the more confidence you have in your stitches and the more ability you have to have really consistent tension, I think that that helps a lot when you're working on linen. Um, you can stitch on denim. Obviously, lots of people stitch on clothing. That's a little bit harder on your hands, but it is it's a great fabric to stitch on, especially once you kind of get that get the hang of it. Um, some people stitch on velvet even, which is a beautiful effect. I'm trying to think, but I think those are probably the most common fabrics to embroider on. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and tie a knot. So see, that's a, that's about how much how much floss I think is is a good amount to be able to still. Do I ever use a stabilizer? I'm trying to think if I have used a stabilizer. I feel like a lot of the times you would use that when you stitch on clothes, and I don't stitch on clothes very often, so I don't even recall if I ever have used a stabilizer to be quite honest. But I do know a lot of people do. Now I'm going to go in and fill in these orange places so we can start moving down and getting a little bit of that checkerboard effect. How do you choose colors for your embroidery? Oh, I love color and I love choosing colors. I sometimes will start with an idea. I actually do most of my designs. I have my iPad with me right here. I take it everywhere I go. And sometimes I'll start with that and I'll do a design on my iPad and kind of mess around pulling in colors in the design that way. And sometimes I'll sit, I actually have um, this, this is what I, this is my 
primary embroidery floss box. And so I just have like them kind of color coordinated in here and I can just sit on, I'll just sit on at a table and pull out colors and, you know, just kind of see how I feel about things. And obviously taking into account color theory to a, a certain extent, but I also think you can get a sense when you're, when you're putting colors together, you know, and can feel what feels good to you. What like looks good. Um, What's going on right there? Okay. All right, so, but color is my favorite thing. I love working with color. The more color, the better. <laughs> I think it's what really got me started doing a lot of these sorts of um, almost abstract wavy line things is that I had the opportunity to use, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 11, plus black, like 12 different colors in one piece. To me, that is, that's living the life, you guys. I love color. And sometimes I'll even go through times where I just have some combinations that I, I really like. Like I really do like any version of purple with orange, you know, lilac with this kind of lighter, almost sherberty color. Just, I, I really like this combination right now. So here, like I said, I'm just going from the empty side and just going directly into a hole that is of the lilac. How do you transfer hand embroidery patterns onto fabric? There are so many ways to do this too, and a lot of it comes down to personal preference. And I'll also say for me, it's one of my least favorite parts of the process, but there are lots of ways to do it. So like I said, I start my designs on my iPad, and then I will oftentimes if it's a simple enough design like this one this morning, I transferred it. I had my fabric in the hoop, like the upside down. I put it on the iPad, which is kind of like a light box at that point. I traced it, took it out of the hoop, flipped it around so that it was on the right side. And then I used a ruler to fix these. Um, Cause this is a pretty simple and basic design. So then I used a ruler to fix the lines and make sure that they were all perfectly straight. If it was a bigger design and I didn't feel like I could, cause it, it will warp a little bit when you flip it, you know, when you're trying to stretch it in the hoop, it, it will warp. And like for things like botanicals, that's usually perfectly fine. I mean, it gives it a little bit more organic feel. It's not an issue or a problem, but if it's something that's very specific, if you're doing a scene of a room and it has a desk and walls and all these straight lines, it can get to a point where you are worried about things getting a little bit too skewed. So I oftentimes use something called Fabrisol V that you can run through your printer. So you could actually print your design on this. You can stitch through it. And then at the end, you've maybe seen people run it, run um, their work underwater and, and it dissolves away. And that way you're basically just sticking a sticker right on the top of this. And there's no distortion, no tracing, which is wonderful in my opinion. Um, but it adds one layer of thickness to your stitching. So it makes it a little bit harder to stitch. I do feel like sometimes I wish that I had a thimble. You know, I've, I've thought about using a thimble when I'm stitching through the fabric solve because it's a little bit harder. Um, so the other thing that you could also do is trace it like this and stitch it upside down, you know, stitch it in the hoop so that it stays like that. And then when you're done with the design, then flip it because at that point it's not gonna get skewed in the same way. I'm trying to think of other ways that I've done it. If you're a really great, you can just, if you're a really great illustrator, you can just hand draw it on it like this, which is, is not something that I uh, would say is my forte. A lot of people also just would hold it up to a window and you can trace it on a window. Um, sometimes again, for the, that issue of things getting skewed, you could trace it on the back and then just hold it up to light and retrace it on the front. If that makes sense. I'm sorry. I'm like, not sure which uh, camera to be working towards with that one, but there are just a lot of different ways that you can transfer. Um, and you can even like, I have at times two printed through a printer directly on fabric. So it's kind of, um, you could probably find tutorials online how to do it, but if you took fabric, just like your basic, you know, cotton, and you got like label paper, like eight and a half by 11 standard printer sticker paper, you can stick 
that on the fabric, trim it down, and then just it, it will run right through your printer and print directly onto the fabric. So for really detailed things, that can be such a wonderful way to do it because everything like the, the lines are not erasable. So at that point, you have to be really mindful of that when you're stitching. But it is a great way to get detail um, perfect on the on the transfer. So a long answer to that question. There are so many different ways to transfer a design to fabric. Okay. And these little guys that can be, obviously, they could be hung on a Christmas tree or hung as decorations. They could even be almost like a, a name tag on a gift, you know, an extra little something on a gift for someone. I like to do a series, so you could do multiples of them. I think that'd be really cute hanging together. And so, as I mentioned, I'm always starting from the edge where there's not embroidery and going into the side that has already has stitches and all.
Okay, we're back. Except that now this is upside down. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that, everyone. Oh, okay. All right, so I'm going to now move down here and keep working with the orange. Where do I buy supplies? So many places, but like I said, I'll, I get a lot of my stuff from um, Michael's or Joann's. Um, it's always fun, if you're into the fabric aspect of it, it's always fun to find like local little fabric shops and quilt stores to find fun fabric. Um, I would really say those are my main places. You can even order floss directly from DMC online. If, you have, if you're in a place where you don't have a store nearby. I'm just gonna go ahead and start another piece of orange. Can I embroider without a hoop? You sure can. It's, I think, a lot harder, it's just because it, you won't have that tension to work with or the fabric won't be as tense, but certainly if you're embroidering on some things, it's really hard to use a hoop. So if you were embroidering like up a pant leg or something like that, being able to embroider without a hoop would be really helpful. I just think it's a it's um it's a pretty good talent to be able to do that without a hoop because I think embroidering with a hoop makes it a little bit easier to manage. So now we're just going back to the orange. And I know there are different thought, well, how many strands of thread do you use when you stitch? Is that very, um, I typically use three strands of embroidery floss and I double it like I'm doing right now. Now, just to explain why I don't just use six strands and leave a tail coming through the top is that it makes the head of the needle pretty thick. So right now I have a total of six. So three going in and three coming out. If you were using all six and not connecting the ends, you would have 12. So you would have six going in and six coming out, which can be a little bit challenging to deal with that much floss going through the fabric. And I also just like that because this is knotted at the end and it's the full length that I don't have to be really mindful to be careful to not pull too hard. You can unthread your needle a lot if you only have the tail going through the top. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so now I'm just gonna keep going here. Another thing I like to do at the beginning too is to pull it back and forth at the knot just to get it laying really flat to start with. And I, I like I mentioned earlier, I like to try to always come up where there's not any stitching and go through a hole where there is already stitching that way you won't leave any visible fabric sections through the piece. And again, like I mentioned earlier as well, once you've got all of your checkerboards completed, we'll run a length of floss down to, to make sure that we cover up any imperfections of the connections. How to finish and display finished embroidery pieces. There's lots of ways to do that too, but I always have loved to just, and I am a, I use nails and just put a nail up on the wall and hang them right on the wall. I have a whole wall in my studio. Once I get my new studio set up here, I just moved into this house, um, a whole wall just covered with embroidery hoops. And it does, I do use nails. So when I, when I move um, 
I do have to like fill all those holes or if, if I sell something and then the space isn't quite right to, to fill, you know, the nails can be a little bit cumbersome, but I do often use that. I do know that um, if you guys follow Kate from Modern Hoopla, she has the cutest little embroidery kind of decorative frames that go around the hoop that you can also hang those on the wall. But she also has these really cool little pegs that you can put in the back. So you could just set it in the frame on in the special hoop. And she has little feet that you can just um, set your hoop in that and it holds it kind of up at a slight angle. So you can display it like right on a table or on a, um, on a shelf. They're really nifty. So you should check it out definitely. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end this one here. And you can see how if I wasn't stopping and starting, I could probably finish this piece pretty quickly. It's a very simple design, but they're so, so fun. I'll flip this one over too. Fun for ornaments and gifts. There have even been um, years when I've made a bunch of different Christmas trees and then made earrings that were kind of similar in style. You know, maybe they'd be checkerboard earrings or what have you, and then sell them as little gift boxes. How did I find my style? To be honest, I still feel like I am finding my style, y'all. I love so many things and that I love, you know, abstract embroidery and I love botanical embroidery and I, I just, I love so many things that at times I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed and like I am kind of going in every direction. Um, I also like trying lots of different things. So I, like I said, I did embroidery. I do work with um, tapestry wool. I make um, polymer clay earrings. I make beaded earrings. I make embroidered earrings. I do a ton of different things. And I think that as you do more and more experimentation and just the more that you do, the more you find where you're drawn and what, what you gravitate towards. Um, and there are, you just, disco, you just kind of, over time, I think it just starts to happen. You have a different way that you stitch. You know, I think there are probably people that could look at my work and kind of tell that it's the way I stitch. Things are pretty colorful, a little bit chunkier um, versus some people that would maybe stitch with really, really um, small amount of thread. So they do really detailed, intricate work. And that, you know, is a choice that makes your work look different as well. I think I would just recommend just trying lots of different things and seeing what you find yourself wanting to do the most and then working with um, with that to really hone in on what makes it special or unique to you. I was listening to, um, I don't know if anyone else is a, list, likes to listen to podcasts, but I was listening to the Creative Pep Talk yesterday when I was driving from Los Angeles up here and um, he had an interview with somebody about finding their style. And one of the things that this man said was that you should, you can start by copying somebody's work just so you can see kind of how, how your version of it looks and then transform it so that you come out the other end with your own kind of look and feel. And he actually mentioned that I think that he thought a lot of people found that when they tried to copy someone, they actually weren't able to do it. But what they did in the meantime was discover something new themselves. So I know there's a lot of talk um, about copying people. And obviously, you should never copy someone's work and then try to sell it or pass it off as your own. But for your own personal practice, as you're developing skills, um, it might be an opportunity to, to push yourself in maybe a new direction and find that even if you can't straight up copy someone, you will find your own like weird way of doing something that uh, gives you your own identity. This one's being a little funky. That's another thing I do a lot too in my stitching is sometimes I'll just run my fingers over, my fingernail over it and it, it really does help smooth things out for some reason sometimes, so. Anyway. What inspired you to start Jen and Handmade? <laughs> um, I think it's probably been like six years that I've been embroidering now, and it's a kind of a multi-dimensional story. But when I was growing up, we had these little Christmas, well, they weren't little, our, our Christmas stockings that hung on the mantle. My aunt 
Joanne made, had hand embroidered one for everyone in the family that had things that were specific to the interests of that person. And I always remember feeling like they were so magical as a child. I loved them. And um, I wanted to recreate something kind of like that for my own home. So I looked for vintage kits and uh, found, oops, look what I just did there. That's not what I wanted to do. So I'm just gonna go back through that hole and take that out and finish this up. But I think the brand was Bucilla, B-U-C-I-L-L-A, that has these very ornate, like sequined Christmas stockings. And I made one for myself and my boyfriend and I really enjoyed it. And around that time, we found out that we were going to be moving and I kind of, to a place that was a little bit remote. And I wasn't super pumped about it at the time. So I, I just, I don't know, I was like searching through Etsy and I came across a pattern, an embroidery pattern. And I decided maybe this is something that can like occupy my time because we're moving someplace where there's like not a lot to do, not a lot going on. So maybe this will be a good use of my time. I had never embroidered before. I'd done a lot of cross stitch as a child and I really loved it. <laughs> like right away, I loved it. So I started doing lots of patterns and then I started um, stitching up illustrations that one of my friends would do. And um, at that point I decided maybe I should try to start making my own designs. So then I started making my own designs and then I started selling some of those pieces and then I had people asking for patterns. So then I started making my own patterns and then I started doing kits and it just kind of all went on and on and on and on, but it all kind of started with making Christmas stockings and being a little bit lonely and a little bit sad. And now here we are today. So um, I hope that answers the question. It's kind of a, a funny journey. We all have our own little funny journeys, right? Oh, the Hoop Feed Supplies, it's modern, M-O-D-E-R-N, Hoopla, H-O-O-P-L-A. She um, does really, really fun things. So I think you really enjoy her offerings. Just really special ways to make, make something a little bit fa fancier, a little bit more special than just in a plain embroidery hoop. But, one thing I will note here, as you can see, these edges are painted and I had really a lot of fun like picking the, the colors and um, painting them, but I always do like to try to make it a little bit intentional and special. So not when I'm done with this, I'll cut the edges, I'll glue it down, I'll pop it off because at that point your glue is on the inside. So you should still be able to remove the outside hoop. And then I just take them, um, you know, regular acrylic craft paint, or sometimes you could use like wood stain to just make a little extra special touch to the edges of that. But if you bought something like from Kate at Modern Hoopla, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't even see the hoop. So you wouldn't necessarily even need to do that, but it is a fun way to add a little bit of extra to, and then make something entirely your own. So it doesn't just look like a, a regular store-bought thing. It's something that you made a decision about, right? And you pick the colors. Can I see what the back looks like? Um, <laughs> that's a um, funny question because I go back and forth on that too. So these pieces were meant to be Christmas ornaments. So I did actually just cut a piece of, it's not even glued in, it's just, it sticks in there. I cut a piece of felt that just pops right in there, but see that I, it's not, I mean, it's not super messy, but it's definitely not super clean. And I could certainly tidy up those stitches and clip them away. But because this was going to be potentially seen from the back, that's why I added that felt in there on the back of these. But to be quite honest, normally I hang mine on the wall and I don't cover the back at all. And I think it's even kind of fun to a certain extent that if somebody wanted to check it out, they could see like, there's a lot of work that went into this. Like it's, it's a lot, there's a lot going on back here. And I think that's okay. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And you can always tidy up a little bit, like some of those longer loose ends at the back, you can just trim those off too. And I know we're almost at time, so I might, once I finish this block, I might go ahead and show you 
what I've been talking about, about how I made that little grid on there. So I'll finish these few more stitches. Tips for 3D stitches, like stump work, I'm assuming maybe, um, which I haven't done yet, but I would definitely check out someone like um, Meg at Meg Embroiders to do that. And I also think there's actually a couple of Domestica courses that teach that 3D stuff that you, so you kind of stitch, stitch it in, on wire so that you can mold it and move it around. I have not tried it, but I definitely would love to because it's always such a crazy cool effect that they get from that. Okay, so now what I did for these lines on here is I just took kind of a contrasting color. I feel like a limey green is almost always something that's a little bit of a surprise, but it adds <laughs> some fun, colorful energy to a piece. So the same thing again, I'm using six strands. I remove the three and then thread my, my needle. Maybe, sorry for my dog. She would like to be in my lap right now, but that's not happening. Oh my goodness. We did, well, we did not get them all. Okay, so now I've got all of them. I'm gonna go ahead, pull the knot at the end. Trim it. And then all I would do, granted, if I finish, if I had this all stitched, I would obviously start at the bottom, but just to give you a sense of what's going to happen here, I just do that and pull it across. And as you can see, it cleans that right up. So then you go down right there, do the same thing over here, go down right there, and then you'll go cross from side to side. Go up here. And then we have just one more. So as you can see, it already like it really cleans up those edges. And if you wanted a finer line, you could use fewer threads at that point too. Just gonna tie a knot in the back. And then for these little these little X's that I did to tack it down, I probably will maybe just use, let's say two strands doubled so that we have a little bit finer detail there. So I'm only gonna take two strands this time. Yeah, so close. To, okay, I'm gonna get it done, you guys. I'm gonna get it done. Okay. My thread is tagged. The first thing I think I would say is use, use shorter lengths of thread. I would also say if you pull it more slowly through, that often helps. And then when you feel like it's starting to wind, sometimes I'll just like, here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Sometimes if you feel like it's starting to tangle or it's starting to get wound up, just kind of hold, hold it up and let just let the um, thread work itself out, you know, do the little spin and then it'll be better. And I do, I do that on a fairly regular basis, but I would say definitely shorter lengths of thread and pulling it slower through gives you a chance to catch it before it gets too bad. So now all I'm doing for these tacking stitches is just coming up one side and going diagonal and then doing the same thing on the other. And then that just pulls it into place, makes sure that the thread will stay. And I just think it's, cute. I really, I like, I really like the look of it. It adds a little bit of a contrast right there, a little extra detail. And, and then you use your discretion on those ones that are not like a full, since you don't have a full lilac block on the other side up here, I would maybe just do like a half one right there. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, Steph. I I loved that piece too. It was a, a fun one to make. If you get your fabric tight enough in the hoop, um, that is a um, something that a lot of us do struggle with. And I, my answer to that is that um, the better quality fabric you use and the smaller your hoops are, the easier it is. But I do this typical way that normally you would do it. You know, you put the fabric in, tighten the screw at the top, pull the fabric around, tighten the screw at the top. Pull, but, but my very special friend is this uh, pliers right here. So I oftentimes need to use this to get it really, really tight and pull really, really tight. I mean, there are times where I'm just like really cranking, but the, the effort you put in at the beginning to prepare it, I think makes a really big difference long-term. Um, and you can also keep retightening as you go. Uh, but I do think high quality fabric, high quality hoops, maybe working with smaller hoops to begin with as you get a little bit of the hang of it. Um, and then I also mentioned too that if I have a real bad buckle that's really bothering me, what I'll do is use a binder clip and I'll pull the fabric tight, put the binder clip over it while I'm working to make sure that the fabric stays tight. And then at the end, um, I glue the back on and that's one of the things that I found to be really helpful too. Uh, haha. Any other questions? I know we only have like two minutes left and I'm sorry that my Apple Watch beeped in the middle and kind of threw things off, but um, let me see. So here is the finished one. Is that what you're there in the middle? Or yeah, <laughs> okay, there we go. So yeah, one little Christmas tree and then this one's a little bit different, so. It's really fun to experiment, you know, with um, all the geometric shapes of Christmas tree is pretty fun to experiment with. So I hope that, um, I hope that everyone enjoyed this class. And like I mentioned at the beginning, I did do a course with Domestica earlier this year that is available. Um, it is all, it's kind of teaching in this style of work that I did on this, this um, piece right here. So using like bands of color and what I, the class also talks about taking your own personal like landscape photography and kind of transferring it into this kind of abstract, colorful embroidery work. Um, and um, there are lots of great domestic courses. So obviously please check out mine, but there are lots of other great embroidery courses and tons of like tapestry weaving. If you like fiber arts in general, there's a lot of really great stuff. So I, uh, encourage you to check it out. Thank you for joining today. Everyone have a great rest of your day. La idea es como algo muy frágil. Se me fue la hebra. I'm going to show you some examples. This is what we've got behind me. ¿Qué más preguntas tengo por aquí? ¿Cómo descubriste que lo tuve?